Good morning, everyone. Apologies for the late start. We were having a little bit of a technical difficulties. So welcome to um, our symposium, Contested Collections, Grappling with History and Forging Pathways for Repatriation. This morning is the second of our four programs, and it's called Entangled Collections, Colonial Histories and the Ethics of Ownership and Stewardship. My name is Jade Alboro. I'm the librarian curator for Southeast Asian Studies and Pacific Island Studies at UCLA and one of the co-leads for the planning team for this symposium. So let us now begin the proceedings with a welcome video from Virginia Steele, the UCLA Norman and Armina Powell University librarian. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for this symposium, Contested Collections, Grappling with History and Forging Pathways for Repatriation. My name is Ginny Steele, and I am the Norman and Armina Powell University Librarian at the UCLA Library. As we begin today, I would like to acknowledge that as a land-grant institution, we at UCLA acknowledge the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, which includes the Los Angeles Basin and the South Channel Islands. Consistent with our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, we believe that understanding the historical and current experiences of indigenous peoples informs the work we do. So again, thank you for coming today. We're really happy to have you here as we open this discussion about repatriation, particularly repatriation as it applies to materials that are held in libraries and archives. As many of us may have realized when thinking about the general topic of repatriation, much of the discussion we've heard over the last several decades has focused on artifacts in museums and art held in museums and galleries, but there's been relatively little attention paid to materials that are in libraries and archives. At UCLA, we were contacted a few years ago by a Jewish institution in Munich to return a book to our collection that belonged to their library but was looted by the Nazis. We gladly returned the item but didn't think much more about it. Then last year, we were contacted another time, a second time, this time by the Jewish Museum in Prague. A curator there contacted Diane Mizrahi, our librarian for Jewish and Israel studies. They had identified three books through Hadi Trust that rightfully belonged to their library. The scanned images in Hadi Trust included their property stamps and accession numbers. When Diane communicated the news to her colleagues in the International and Area Studies Department in the UCLA Library, their outreach team, led by Jade Alburo, felt that it was important not just to share what UCLA is doing in repatriating these books, but to use it as a jumping off point to initiate a broader dialogue about repatriation, why there's a need for it in the first place, and why it continues to be a difficult and complicated discussion. This symposium provides a more global context for this conversation by acknowledging the long history of colonialism, war, and even field research that has led to cultural heritage materials being taken from their communities and countries. As libraries, archives and other cultural memory institutions begin to talk about decolonizing their collections, it is crucial to recognize that decolonization is not just about adding underrepresented voices to our collections, but it's also about understanding how materials in our collections came to be there, how they were obtained, whether they were taken from their original owners without their consent, and whether and how they should be returned to the communities and individuals from whom they were taken. In this symposium, you will hear about various issues related to repatriation, including notions of ownership and caretaking. You'll hear examples from museums and libraries because we hope that many institutions will be interested in exploring and implementing reparative practices. You will also hear examples of existing policies and procedures that institutions and government agencies have put in place. And we'll have some ideas for working with the communities that own the materials in the first place. 
We're very happy to have you with us as we explore this for ourselves and determine what our next steps should be. At the UCLA Library, we are very committed to restitution and we do expect to do more in the future. We hope you will be too. I'd like to thank everyone at UCLA who's been involved in the planning of this symposium, Jade Alboro and Tula Oram for leading the planning team, as well as members Elena Ising, Dana Laterer, and Yesenia Perez. Additional thanks to Sharon Farb, Shannon Tanhai Ahari, Giselle Rios, Magali Salas, the library communications team and library business services. And thank you to the UCLA Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies for co-sponsoring the symposium. We appreciate all the hard work of all these individuals and the contributions that have been made. And we thank you for bringing us all together. And to our uh, viewers and members of the audience, thank you again for joining us today. I look forward to continued discussion with many of you as we all try to figure out what the best way is to approach the need for us to look at our collections and identify materials that were taken without consent from their owners and return them to the communities and individuals where they belong. Enjoy the symposium. Thank you, Ginny, for that welcome. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce you to our moderator, Dr. Susan Slimovich. Susan Slimovich is a distinguished professor of anthropology and Near Eastern languages and cultures at UCLA. Her latest publication is Race, Trace, and Place, Essays in Honor of Patrick Wolf, um, of which she's a co-editor. Her research interests focusing on the Middle East and North Africa are concerned with reparations, truth commissions, economic anthropology, human rights, visual anthropology, preservation, and heritage. Her current research project is on col French colonial statues, monuments, and heritage in Algeria. Everyone, welcome Dr. Slimovich. Uh, thank you very much, Jade. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, remarkable symposium. It's also my pleasure to introduce our three speakers for the second of four sessions spread across three days, organized by the UCLA Library on the occasion of their restituting Nazi looted books to the Prague Jewish Museum, currently here in the collection. Uh, the Symposium Contested Collections has as its second session, um, the topic of entangled collections, colonial histories and the ethics of ownership and stewardship. We're featuring three speakers who provide an overview of the global history of colonialism and its outside, outsized role in the development of cultural heritage collections in Euro-American spaces. The examples by the speakers about repatriation to Africa and Southeast Asia, what's in museums in Europe, all open discussions about the ethics of stewardship, varying legal regimes of artifacts as property, the struggle by formerly colonized countries to reclaim their heritage and what constitutes full restitution. It's a pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Alice Proctor, an art historian and writer working on colonial memory in museums. She is the author of the recent publication entitled The Whole Picture, The Colonial Story of the Art in Our Museums and Why We Need to Talk About It. She also ran the Uncomfortable Art Tours Project from 2017 to 2020. Thank you, Alice Proctor, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Um, hi everyone, I'm really thrilled to be here and thank you for having me. I don't actually have any images to share today, mostly because of my own <laughs> ongoing technical difficulties, um, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about the work that I've been doing for the past few years and the places that I've seen the conversations around memory and restitution and power go in museums. So for some context, I am settler Australian. I was born on what is Gadigal land in Australia, um, but I live in London at the moment and I'm mostly based in the UK. 
one of the reasons that my bio is a little bit thin is that I am about to start a PhD project. And so there's not much to say about me at the moment. Um, but for the last three years, I've last five years, I've been working on the Uncomfortable Art Tours. So my background is in art history and visual and material culture. And I'd been working as an educator with school children and university groups in museums. And I brought the research that I had and the work that I'd been doing around colonial storytelling, memory, narratives around repatriation and restitution, and turned them into tours for adult audiences. So the idea was that I could bring groups into galleries and talk about the kind of contested histories and narratives of imperialism on display that were not necessarily immediately obvious, and that in many cases the museums and institutions themselves were actively avoiding and shutting down. I was able to do this because in the UK I had access to free public galleries, and being in London it was immediately kind of available to work with so many objects that connected to colonial history. It was interesting to me from the beginning how many people didn't recognize that this was something that might be sort of worth doing or worth time. And I would say that although there is a huge amount of work and scholarship around repatriation and restitution and the representation of colonial history in museums, the kind of public scrutiny around that scholarship has dramatically increased in the last decade. I do genuinely think, at least in my experience in the UK, the sort of public conversations that we're now having in the media around repatriation would not have been possible five years ago, 10 years ago. And the level of awareness has dramatically increased. That's not to say that the work has necessarily accelerated, although I do think it's under greater scrutiny, but there has been a change in the way that this conversation is happening. So, a lot of the work that I've been doing has been object-led storytelling. With tour groups, I go into museum spaces and I look at what's already on display. As a educator who doesn't work for or necessarily with these institutions, there's a limit to what I can do with the objects in the collections. If something's not on display, if there's not sort of information and access and sort of visual avail availability, it's very difficult to tell stories with those objects. My intention was always to use what was already on show, use what was already accessible and available, and try and bring the stories of repatriation, restitution, contested heritage to a public audience who didn't necessarily have a scholarly background and in many cases hadn't even visited these museums before. So with my tours, the aim was more than anything to tell stories. And obviously that had to be based in research, but it was incredibly important to me that these became conversational spaces. I worked very hard to find a way of maintaining a kind of empathetic and considerate atmosphere for the attendees on my tours. Everyone approaching these conversations is coming from a different point of proximity. And it very quickly became clear that there were people who had really never thought about their connection to colonial history before, hadn't even occurred to them that they might be living with its consequences. Meanwhile, there were other people who felt it very immediately, felt it in their own families and in their own lifetimes. And so establishing a kind of base level, firstly of information, but also of emotional uh, literacy for the groups was incredibly important. A lot of the work I've done since then has been with educators. I focused a lot on the way that we tell stories in museum spaces, specifically in order to try and facilitate a more empathetic conversation. So for example, I have a no devil's advocate rule on my tours. It's important that we're very conversational and we think about the ways that people engage with this history. But at the same time, if I think you're picking a fight for the sake of it, that will be shut down. Asking questions and engaging sort of open and considerate discussion is very different from the kind of combative language that some people would try and use on tours. And as part of that, it was very important to try and make space for emotional responses. If you are taking a group on a tour of a museum and you don't know the backgrounds of all of those people in your group and you've never met them before, it's not possible to predict what people will have an emotional response to. And I think that many educators and people working in this kind of field might have had the experience of someone in a tour group becoming quite intensely emotional around an object that isn't necessarily the one that you would have predicted. But making it clear 
that these are narratives that have a very human impact has been an incredibly important process. So with that said, one of the things that I've been trying to move towards in my work as an educator and as a tour guide is a different way of training staff in galleries. I am able to do what I do because I come in as an outsider. And again, I'm very much working in museums and art galleries in the UK. And I think many of you will have also had this experience. The people doing the front of house roles are overwhelmingly volunteers or docents. They're overwhelmingly underpaid, undertrained, incredibly knowledgeable, incredibly skilled at what they do, but not necessarily the people who receive the most support from the institutions in which they work. There are obviously exceptions to that rule. But overwhelmingly, the front of house staff in museums here in the UK are either paid security guards who don't have a relationship with the collections because they haven't been encouraged to, or they're volunteers. So part of the empathy of the space has to be towards the people on the front line of the institution. But I've also found in the work that I have done in a more collaborative way with museums that often there's a total lack of training in terms of how to handle these very difficult and sensitive conversations. When we talk about repatriation and restitution, I think it is incredibly important to have lofty goals. And when we talk about contested heritage, we have to keep the kind of ultimate end goal of repatriation in mind. At the same time, it's really important to recognize that restitution is a process. And along the way, there will be stages of conversation, of discourse, of research. And you have to empower your gallery staff to handle them. So often I've seen the researchers and the curators who are responsible for these projects as completely disconnected from the actual kind of museum front lines. And when you don't have a kind of narrative and conversation moving between those spaces, that information is not making it out to the public. I've worked with institutions in a more official capacity now, and something I've seen happen again and again is that the museum will say, well, we're doing research on this, but we don't really want to share it until we're certain. And we've, we're starting to think about the provenance, but we don't want to give people incorrect information. So we're just going to sit on it until we know absolutely for sure what's happening here. And I understand that instinct. Um, it's an instinct of self-preservation and particularly one to protect yourself from an often very hostile uh, news media that has very much taken against repatriation and restitution as a goal. But within that, I think making room for uncertainty and recognizing that clarity is very rare when we're talking about these objects is so important. Many of the pieces that I work with in museum collections have immediate and obvious traceable histories of violence in their legacies. We can immediately look at some of these pieces and know where they came from, how they came to be here, who made them, and how that history has been violated. There are other objects where we will never know that, and those pieces might not necessarily be sought for repatriation, but they are still part of this conversation of moving towards restitution. The way that we engage with uncertain objects, sort of precarious objects, things like uh, tourist art, which I often use in my work, which has been, for example, produced by an indigenous community specifically for trade with European settlers. That's an incredibly important object to understanding the development of these power relations. And those objects have to be considered and understood alongside the objects that are sought for repatriation. We have to think about the way that material histories have been negotiated over time. I'm very much in favor of repatriation and I'm very much in favor of the kind of rigorous provenance histories and research that leads to that. But I would like to caution people who work in museums and heritage spaces against reaching for absolute certainty and instead find ways of working with this ambiguity and uncertainty. Your instincts might be very good about when an object does require more research into repatriation and things like that, but you also need to make room for the fact that sometimes these stories are not immediately obvious and it won't necessarily be clear until you begin to think about them and think about the way that they've been understood by your audiences, what to do with them. I would say sort of to round this thought off, um, I think that questioning authority within museums and historical collections is actually an act of care towards the objects that we hold. The idea of uncertainty 
and instability can be really frightening for those of us who are working in heritage and conservation and things like that. But best practice and most knowledge and most kind of perfect information is always a moving target. I think we can learn a lot from the way that many science and technology museums are having to be incredibly flexible and adapt their information and displays and research constantly. This is obviously a generalization, but I've seen a real reluctance in the institutions that I've worked with and against and for here in the UK to engage with uncertainty. Finding the kind of unfixedness of these narratives is incredibly important. Colonial histories of violence, histories of trauma, histories of settler colonialism, invasion and genocide are stories that have been very deliberately silenced, erased, denied. And the consequence of that is that it's often incredibly difficult to find certainty within them. Approaching them with as much empathy as possible and as much consideration for what might be or might be possible or plausible can be a really important step. This isn't against research, this isn't against scholarship, it's alongside the kind of material care and conservation work and provenance work that has to happen. But if that work is happening entirely behind the scenes and it's not available to your general audiences and your visitors and your staff, then in many cases, it might as well not be happening. If you're not facilitating your front of house staff, your volunteers, your educators to talk about these contested histories, then the visitors to your museums are met with a blank wall. And if your guides and educators shut down every conversation about colonial history before it even begins, I can understand why that might make you feel safer in terms of not wanting to put out information that you're not certain about, but it really does make you look like you have something to hide. And although more and more museums here in the UK are being open about the fact that they're researching their collections, that research in progress is often still obscured. And that's not something that increases trust. It's not something that increases goodwill. If anything, it feels like a delaying tactic. Um, and obviously I'm speaking about this as someone who works as an educator and is in a kind of ambiguous space of insider and outsider within the museum sector. But yeah, I say all of this with a lot of love and a lot of care towards the people I know who work in museums and who deal with these things every day. But ultimately, I think the care that we have and the duty of care that we have towards audiences and to the objects in these collections is more important than the anxiety that a researcher might feel about sharing their work before it's complete. I wanted to offer that to you as a bit of a starting point and kind of a provocation more than anything else. Um, but thank you for inviting me to be here and I'm really looking forward to our conversation later on. Thank you very much, Alice Proctor. Um, our, our next speaker um, is Dr. Ndebisi Azailumba. He is He was actually the Francoise Billion Richardson curator of uh, African art at the New Orleans Museum of Art <clears throat> until last week. He holds a PhD in art history from the University of Florida Gainesville and specializes in the visual cultures of Olican shrines. While at the University of Florida, he served as a research assistant at the Harn Museum of Art and worked on the exhibition entitled Congo Across the Waters. He was also the Andrew W. Mellon Research Specialist in African Art at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts for a project to study the museum's African collection. He is active in conversations on repatriating African cu cultural patrimony, delivering lectures, contributing book chapters, and articles on the topic. Next week, and please accept our congratulations, he returns as the African curator at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Welcome, Dr. Azai Lumba. Thank you very much. Can I start with the next slide, please? I, I always start my presentation putting up the slide. That little gray, gray um, patch and that uh, map is Benin Kingdom. 
Um, I will not forget to point at the historical incident that resulted to the looting of Benin art in 1897. Um, although although this, this is not a historical talk, but I think you know, putting those little stories um, as part of our conversation will help create a clearer picture about what we are trying to address. Next slide, please. The British government acting upon requests from the Royal Niger Company to remove the Benin King who was seen as an obstacle to trade. Um, in February 1897, the British force of about 1,200 men, um, supported by several hundred African auxiliaries, besieged Benin City. The raid, which, um, which in the literature sometimes is called the British punitive expedition, um, was carried out on Benin and they, they bombarded Benin City for three days. Um, from, the, from the seaport of Fugoton. They touched the city and looted 500 years worth of bronze, of bronzes, brass and ivory sculptures, as you can see from that slides. These were, these were treasures that constituted the royal archives of Benin Kingdom. The king at the time of Balvorawen, um, who ruled between 1888 to 1914 was deposed and sent to die in exile in the, in the southeastern part of Nigeria. Uh, and then the British um, incorporated Benin City into the colonial nation of Nigeria. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Benin art. So starting from this slide, um, during this glorious period um, from the 13th to the 19th century, uh, Benin produced one of the continent's most sophisticated artistic um, legacies. To reflect the splendor of the royal court, the king, or they call them the Obers, commissioned highly skilled artisans to create rare and beautiful works of cast brass and carved ivories. Can I see the next slide? This included human and animal forms. There were also relief plaques, elephant tusks, pendants, bracelets, uh, life size commemorative heads and queen mothers and ceremonial objects to adorn royal palace and altars. Flip through more of the slides, please, to show you the, the, the range of what Benin, um, yeah, stop at this slide. So, you know, characteristically, um, <clears throat> Benin art was created um, first and foremost, just the king and his elaborate court because um, the, the king of Benin was looked upon as the representative of, of you know, the spirits on it. So every um, artwork created using precious materials were reserved for him. It was his own uh, prerogative or you know, it's his own decision to you know, share those objects to other highly placed individuals in, in society. And he also can gift them out to people he chooses at various points in time. Benin art was, was a royal art and dedicated to the service of the king and the complex rituals that complement his status in society. Even though the art can be looked as religious art, uh, it was normally royal in its general makeup because the material used for its creation. In the past, brass and ivory where the exclusive reserve of the king, he determined who could have access to this object. Um, and due to these characteristics, it was no wonder that um, my late friend, J uh, Joseph Nevadomsky, um, uh, states that the technical virtuosity and the artistic excellence of Benin art astonished, then puzzled the European curators uh, when they first came in contact with them immediately after 1897. And what Joseph was pointing at here was that immediately after the raid of Benin in 1897, a lot of Benin art were, were stolen and taken to England. And from England, it was sold around Europe and eventually came to America. Um, so, so, you know, um, you see the network of, you know, um, of dissemination of this stolen object. It traveled from, from, from the location where it got to after, after the raid and then it spread up to America. Um, and that brings me to the next slide to repatriate, to return, to bring things back. You know, that is where um, I think within this um, slide, I frame my conversation about the three arrows. 
And the three arrows to me is to repatriate, to restitute, and to reparate. Um, <clears throat> no doubt that the conversation about repatriation of cultural patrimony of Africa rages on. While the extraction and deprivation of cultural heritage and cultural property concerns the generation who participates in plundering, as well as those who must suffer through extraction, it also becomes inscribed throughout the long duration of societies, conditioning the flourishing of certain societies while simultaneously continuing to weaken others. Re repatriation efforts are commendable and important activities which are, which are carried out for the continuous reminder of indigenous people's artifacts in someone um, else's possession. It helps to cast light on the history and cultural relevance of these objects. By engaging with such debates, the essence of its importance will unfold and we can begin to implement concrete action towards the repatriation of the cultural patrimony of Africa, especially those looted from the United Kingdom, which is the, which is the focus of my talk this morning. Um, my idea about repatriation have, have actually um, engineered a lot of um, reactions. Sometimes people cons uh, confuse my perspective to mean that I am caving in um, about not wanting the objects to go back. But I started my idea of repatriation with sense to, 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 you know, to take on the conversation even much more meticulously and sensibly. I use those two words because um, conversation, uh, repatriation conversation is not happening only since um, the, the fall of the, 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 the winter of 2017 when Emmanuel Macron made a declaration at a university on, at Ouagadougou um, repatriation conversation has, has actually started uh, in mid 20th century. And every effort at African repatriation has actually, just like um, uh, Alice, Alice was talking about now, has actually kind of withered away because of um, uh, the way it has been handled. But I think um, in, in 2017, when Emmanuel Macron made a declaration, um, the, the, start, the, the status of the individual making the declaration actually created the oomph that the conversation needed to move forward. And, and having moved, you know, moved forward, and then he, he actually matched his word with action by um, commissioning two scholars, one uh, Benedict Savoy and um, fellow in Sa. So commissioning them to actually um, um, you know, work out modalities for you know, repatriation to work. So, 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 you know, um, my advocation of, of repatriation with sense um, latches on, on this idea of the renewed um, uh, interest on repatriation conversation, and then declare that first and foremost, objects need to be returned. But you're not asking, do we really have to do physical return sometimes? In a recent conversation with uh, Professor Dan Hicks of um, the, the Oxford University, who also steward the, the Pitt Rivers Museum uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, we have looked at it even much more deeply. Um, repatriation could be admission of guilt. Admission of guilt can actually be the, the, the starting point of healing. And then my, advoc my advocation of repatriation with sense comes with a whole new package of you know, um, um, relationship building. Um, if, if, if your ancestors stole my stuff. And then um, we have now come to this point where we are rational enough to speak about it. If, if, if I get the admission from you, and then we can then form in, a new network of relationship to like, you know, work with this material. Because first and foremost, the work of art was created for mankind's enjoyment. And then angrily or, you know, irrationally taking it away and bringing it back and keeping it back may not solve the larger problem or, or you know, may not be helpful in, you know, in the long run if we are going to enjoy this object. So my, my advocacy for repatriate what to sense um, has advocated for what I have termed um, human infrastructure development. 
What I mean by that is that Western institution that has held this object until now should be bold enough to, you know, bring about ideas and programs that will bring um, folks from the continent to come and understudy or learn how to steward this object because museum in the first place are Western invention. Not that Africans don't have a museum ideology, but just that for them to have variety to help modify their museum ideology, the human infrastructure development becomes very important. I always use a story to you know, buttress this point. When I started out field research um, at the beginning in, in 2005 and six, I, I had returned to Benin City to do some fieldwork research. And I went into, um, into the National Museum that was located at the heart of the city. I have been there for two days trying to find archival material to work with I couldn't find. And as I was about leaving the second day, um, I was approached by a janitor on my way out. He, he obviously saw that I have been there for two days and I was very angry, I couldn't find nothing. And he stopped me and said, hey, do you want um, an old map of Benin Kingdom? My face lit up, I was so excited. I wanted to see that map because how could I have been here for two days, I couldn't find nothing. And I said, yes, let's go back and you go show me. And he said, mm -mm -mm, we're not going back. I have them at home. I can bring them tomorrow if you are going to come out here and pay for them. This is one of the people who are supposed to be museum workers, who are supposed to educate people about what happened to the museum. I take that as a case in point. That guy probably never got the right training and did not understand the importance of these cultural materials that is kept um, under his care. So if we invest in human infrastructure development, coupled with, the, with, with this big news, uh, this big story in the news about a new museum that is being conceived for Benin City, I believe that it will actually end in a win-win type situation whereby uh, museums in America, I'm, I'm not gonna refer to my colleagues in Europe, uh, will be um, active participant in the development of you know, museum activities in the continent by creating shows that potentially could show in the continent and also exchange ideas with this um, other institution. If we, can, if we can hack in onto that idea and create those, those network of relationships, I strongly feel that most of our clamor for repatriation will be abated because a lot will be gained from both sides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Azailumba. Um, our next speaker is Panga Ardiancia. He is a PhD candidate in the history of art and archeology span at SOAS University of London. He focuses on the afterlives and knowledge production of Hindu Buddhist materials in Indonesia, which then brought him to colonial collecting practices and object restitution, as well as the historiography of modern Indonesia. He recently co-edited a book entitled Returning Southeast Asia's Past, Objects, Museums, and Restitutions, and he also has published blog posts, one of them object repatriation and knowledge co-production for India's cultural artifacts. His uh, presentation is recorded because he's conducting field research with possible connectivity problems. And if internet connections permit, he will join us in person and participate in the discussion. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Panga and in these presentations, I will be talking about Jogjakarta manuscripts from Indonesia and their entangled stewardships. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, UCRA Library for the invitations. 
and I feel really privileged to be able to speak in these sessions to discuss my perspectives on issues related to contested collection and object restitutions. In these presentations, I would argue for the kinds of stewardships that could be engendered by repatriation process upon mutual understanding. So uh, for our discussions, uh, the story originates in the island of Java at the palace of Yogyakarta, as you can see from the slide, which is in the central part of the Java island. Uh, the palace was founded in 1755, following an agreement negotiated by the Dutch East Indies Company to pacify the power struggle happening at the time in Java. In this historical context, um, the manuscript production for palaces in Java, particularly in the central part of Java, was important part of was important part of court traditions in legitimizing the current rulers both by providing royal genealogies with supposed supreme mythical power and by projecting the rulers as custodians of culture. Due to the climate condition, however, uh, manuscripts at the time were preserved through copying and rewriting. And this uh, would be uh, confused with the literary value of the manuscript as well, because some stories are claimed to happen several decades before. And it is also not uncommon to have new manuscripts, copies composed from different texts tied together into a new historical narrative. So in the early uh, 19th century, the island of Java was a colony under the Dutch authority. However, due to the Napoleonic War, the Dutch was annexed and absolved under the rule of French Empire in 1810. Worry about the threat that might be posted by the French in the Far East region, uh, Thomas Stamford Raffles from the British East India Company successfully made a case to capture Java with the British force was able to oust the Dutch rule from the island, from the island uh, on September 1811. Uh, the British colonial administration over the island was short-lifted, however, uh, with Java returned fully to the control of the Netherlands by 1816, uh, following the end of the Anglo-French War. But uh, the British Interregnum has enduring legacies until today. Uh, during the Interregnum, uh, Raffles as the Lieutenant Governor General became the de facto administrator of Java at the time, and he demanded full submission from the local rulers. However, the Sultan of Yogyakarta Palace continued to defy Raffles expectations, though what the Sultan demanded was merely to be respected as a counterpart to the British authority. Due to a series of misunderstandings, uh, Raffles finally decided to storm the Palace of Yogyakarta in the morning of 20th of June 1812. This event is still being remembered in local memory by the name of Geiger Spehi or the space havoc, uh, which spay refers to the Indian Sepoy infantry contracted by the British as their main force in Java. Uh, the palace of Yogyakarta was ransacked at the time, and uh, many valuables were taken as war loot. Uh, one interesting thing is that manuscripts are, were also collected, particularly by these three peoples, uh, the Toma, Thomas Temple Raffles, John Crawford, that was the uh, resident of Yogyakarta, and Colin McKenzie, uh, the chief engineer of British Army in Java. Not limited to these three peoples, but these three are the uh, were the uh, the biggest collector at the time. Um, they collected the manuscript under the assumption that the manuscript would give them knowledge on the culture and history of Java. However, uh, Raffles and Crawford would soon be, be disappointed when they concluded that the manuscripts were less uh, historical account and more of literature value according to them. Until today, we have not known how many manuscripts were taken at the time and probably some less beautiful and presumed to be less important manuscript might be sought after the ransacking as well to the local people outside the palace. 
Uh, however, 75 manuscripts were identified in the British Library, particularly during the production of a catalog from the Indonesian manuscript in Great Britain. Uh, following the visit of the Palace of Yogyakarta in 2017, uh, the manuscripts were finally digitized through the funding from uh, Mr. S. P. Lohia, whose foundation concerned with rare manuscripts. By 2019, uh, the digital copies for all the manuscripts in the British Library are already made freely and fully accessible in the British Library website. This is the important part of the uh, afterlife of the uh, manuscript from Yogyakarta that currently some of the most beautiful manuscripts are being displayed in the permanent gallery in the British Library uh, called the Treasure of the British Library Exhibitions. And it's also worth reading uh, the caption aloud to, for us to couch the what is uh, happening at this uh, exhibition as well. Uh, so the caption reads, the British Library holds a rich collection of Japanese manuscripts this includes work on history, ethics, Islamic practice and law, and a literature primarily written in verse, as well as archive, archival documents and letters. Manuscripts are written on European paper or Dluang, a Japanese paper made from beaten tree bark. Some books are beautifully illuminated in colors and gold, and illustrated with figures influenced by the angular shape of Wayang Kulit puppets from the Sado Theater, the pinnacle of Japanese art forms. On display here are five manuscripts from the Royal Library of Yogyakarta in Central Java, acquired after an attack by British forces in June 1812. With general support of Mr. S. P. Lohia, 75 Japanese manuscripts from Yogyakarta have recently been digitized and are now freely accessible online. So from reading these captions, we know that these manuscripts in the British Library are uh, being valued as uh, art objects and also as knowledge depository. Um, we also should acknowledge that um, the British Library acknowledge the uh, the colonial violence that happens on the back of the acquisition of this manuscript as well uh, though not so much use the word loot in the captions but still it is a sober self-assessment from the british library and we should uh, acknowledge that as well also happening in 2019 uh, the palace of Yogyakarta held an international seminar uh, to celebrate the crowning anniversary of the current Sultan. Annabel Gallup, uh, the lead curator of Southeast Asian manuscript in the British Library was invited. And uh, during the seminar, she noted that there were already papers presented using digitally accessible manuscript from the British Library websites, meaning that uh, the sort of digital repatriation of the manuscripts is already reaping rewards uh by opening up and democratizing access to the production of knowledge meaning that people doesn't have to go to uh to london physically to access the manuscripts but they can do it from indonesia or from uh, other part of the world as well um and at the at the event as well in the uh in, in the um, conjunction with the international seminar the then uh, British ambassador to Indonesia, uh, Muazza Malik, handed over the digital master copies of the Yogyakarta manuscript from uh, the British Library to the current Sultan of Yogyakarta. And uh, this handover events uh, in Indonesia was being celebrated as, uh, by the Indonesian media, being celebrated as the return of, quote, missing link, unquote which were gone for more than 200 years and it is hoped that the written manuscript would be reproduced and are hoped to generate new knowledge as inspired by the palace of Yogyakarta. so from here uh, all seems well and proper uh, nonetheless there are still some voices that um, request uh, that the uh, physical manuscript should be written as well, since they are uh, pusaka from the palace of Yogyakarta. So they, their reasoning is that these manuscripts are 
uh, considered as pusaka for the palace. So listen then, what is pusaka? Uh, the word pusaka is widely used in Malay and Japanese languages. And in the context of Japanese cultures, where the palace of Yogyakarta located, uh, pusaka ultimately refers to the rules, authority, and power. Um, pusaka has a more pronounced attachment to the ruler. Uh, in this sense, the communal value of pusaka derives from the functions and sacred duty of the rulers owing the pusaka to hold the world together, not to descend into chaos. The holders of pusaka is said to be divinely chosen, thus projecting uh, a spiritual prowess, which signify an aspiration for a better future through the rules of a community. Uh, more importantly for our discussions, uh, some consider pusaka, that pusaka are objects and property left by the ancestors and are central to the sense of identity of their owners. Um, however, on the other hand, pusaka is also a, a social construct. Uh, and in that sense, uh, pusaka are best understood within the context of under which uh, social structure they are operated. Some criteria of pusaka that could be generated include uh, quality of workmanship, and materials, um, aesthetic value, history and religious significance as well. So from that explanation, um, we um, see that there are differing point of view. Uh, as shown in the treasure of the British Library exhibitions, the Yogyakarta Manus Manus manuscripts are being viewed by the British Library as both artistic object and knowledge container which in turn could be coached through digital modes without any different than physical reading or physical ownership. On the other hand, uh, these same manuscripts uh, at the same time are still considered as the pusaka of the palace of Yogyakarta, which ultimately places their uh, significance in differing values. As pusaka, the contact with the physical manuscript is more, is more or at least as important as the content itself. In terms of national and communal identity, physical ownership of pusaka becomes paramount, since closer, in, closer physical engagements could stimulate a closer connection to the collective memory as well. So understanding that differing point of view, what should we do to move uh, the discussion forwards? So as I have discussed in previous slides, I hope that I have shown that there are differing regime of values embedded into the same objects by differing communities, which should encourage us to be open and understanding to other kind of valuation to an object. As uh, for my second point on equal footing, uh, this concerns uh, with the, uh, or this concern is generated from other repatriation example that have happened in Indonesia throughout the, the years uh, or the decades, whereby more of the time, the Indonesian themselves do not have a say or, or an agency or the power to select which objects they actually wanted to be returned. So the initiative uh, to select of select object often comes from the country who repatriated the objects. Of course, they could be right or uh, on other case, they could be uh, less right as well, such as the debacle of the return of the Nusantara collections from uh, Delft in the, in the Netherlands, where the discussion about which objects should be returned to Indonesia were, were happening back and forth, and uh, it took uh, longer than um, two years to actually finalize which objects that can be returned. So. In this sense, uh, equal footings should mean that the former colonized countries are accepted in the tables and have equal say on which and how and why objects should be repatriated. Thank you and very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much to the three speakers. Um, at the moment, what we're gonna start is a Q&A based on some of the questions that have come into the um, um, box that is available to me. 
So uh, my first question uh, and the first set of questions, of course, go to the first speaker. Um, and this is to Alice Proctor. And there's sort of two questions. One of them has to do with um, asking for more information about why there is media hostility to restitution in the United Kingdom. And I would sort of add another part to it, which is, is it the case that settler societies and settler citizens, you introduced yourself as a settler Australian, we are in some sense that we are settler Americans, um, are more open than um, um, institutions, museum people, the public in the UK to possibilities even of discussing restitution or dealing with uh, violent colonial heritage in museums? So, I mean, yeah, I would say for a start that my experience and position as a settler Australian, but specifically as someone who's lived in the UK for most of my life, but hasn't had UK citizenship most of that time, has been a huge part of how I understand my position in museums and the work that I'm doing in relation to colonial history. Um, I think it's quite common for people who have a diasporic background or a migratory history in their family, like no matter how recent that is. Um, in my case, it's literally that I was born overseas and I came to the UK. In other people's cases, it might be like histories of displacement and migration. It might be voluntary or involuntary movement. If you have that, you're probably more likely to be sensitive to these questions. And I think it's no accident that a lot of the people that I know who are working on this in the UK are first, second, third generation migrants to this country. I would, in answer to the question about the media, um, amongst conservative media, particularly print media in the UK at the moment, there has been a very big backlash against what is often referred to as woke politics. Um, I don't think that that term is being used correctly there at all. I also don't think I'm the person to try and define that term, but it's used in a kind of catch-all in the same way that we see terms like critical race theory being thrown around as a euphemism for essentially history, politics, academic work that decenters. Uh, white supremacist histories or histories of imperialism and colonialism, and instead focuses on those stories as told by the people who were subjugated by imperialism, for example. There's been a huge backlash to a number of projects here, including some by the National Trust, um, which uh, is a very traditional, very conservative institution, but has in, been involved in creating programs around colonial history and attempting to, in the kind of historic houses that they conserve, make that history visible and accessible. There have been very direct personal attacks on people who are involved in projects around restitution and repatriation, as well as around projects more generally to do with um, colonial history. It's complicated, obviously, but there has been a very significant backlash uh, from conservative media, particularly outlets on the right, um, about the idea of repatriation and restitution. There's just a lot of this going on here at the moment, um, and particular sort of narratives around things like suppose quote unquote cancel culture, um, supposed historical erasure. It's it's the kind of euphemisms and keywords that I think a lot of you are probably familiar with. Um, and yeah, it's created an environment where many institutions are trying to deal with this, but don't necessarily have the resources to give their staff social media training for protection online and that sort of thing. Well, thank you very much. So um the other question still for Alice was the idea of whether you could give an example from an object or from an, uh, a conversations among your tour group, what might be the range of emotional responses that um, you mentioned that left a long lasting impression on you or even the members of your tour group? Yeah, so um, I thought about sharing this, but I decided not to because it's quite important. Um, I will talk about it now. Uh, there is content warning that I have to talk about histories of sexual violence in this case, um, and histories in the representation of sexual assault and particularly violence against Indigenous women. That's the reason that I didn't show you the image of it. 
Um, but there is an object in the British Museum that is a Haida carving uh, from what is now British Columbia, Haida Gwaii, that shows a man who is most likely European holding a woman who is most likely indigenous at gunpoint. And there's a heavy implication in the scene and in the object of sexual violence, especially when we put it in the context of what we know about the histories of missing and murdered Indigenous women, the increased rates of sexual violence, and the history of sexual violence as a tool of colonialism used against Indigenous women in what is now Canada and the United States. I talk about this object because we don't know who made it, we don't know why it was made, it was most likely a it's kind of considered a tourist object. Um, so it's possible that it was made as some kind of like very sick joke, but equally we know so little about the maker and so little about its history and provenance that when I talk about it on my tours, it's in the context of imagining an alternative narrative here and considering that this might in fact be a kind of testimony. It's a really heavy subject. Um, and it's one of the few places on my tours where I give a specific content warning. I give a general content warning at the beginning. There are very few objects that require a kind of more explicit and specific, like avoid this room if you don't want to have this conversation kind of objects. And it is difficult to talk about. It's um, towards the end of my British Museum tour and I find it very like heavy um, and audience members have told me about personal resonances that they've had with that object and I use it and I work with it because I think it's an important story to tell but it is not an easy story to tell um, and the difficulty of that is something that I have to be conscious of I have to be conscious of it for the people in my group I have to be aware of the other people in the gallery who might overhear us um, but it's one of the spaces where I try and create as much empathy as possible and as much consideration as possible, partially through the use of content warnings, but also uh, by trying to kind of hold and care for the audiences in my tours. I hope that answers your question. Um, it's a very specific and very tricky case study, but that is the kind of most obvious and most extreme example of some of the work that I'm trying to do. Oh, thank you very much. So there's several questions on digitization, which I'll sort of try and put together. And they would be both for uh, um, our uh, other two speakers on Benin and uh, Joe Jakarta. And it has to do with uh, the, the shared uh, fact that you were both talking about uh, artwork that comes out of royal courts, that comes out of uh, palaces, and was foliated, looted as a result of punitive expeditions. So um, both of you kind of laid out an interesting typology of what might be needed for restitution. And it's also a hierarchy and a series of steps. So there is new relational networks that allow for dialogue, educational exchanges. There's an admission of guilt is another one. Uh, there's the physical return versus the offer of a digital sharing. So you've both come down differently on all these four steps. So I was wondering if both of you could each address that. What are the problems of, of each of them, especially digital sharing? and why would it be rejected or accepted? So um, Dr. Azalumba first. I think I've, I've actually um, um, had that, that you know, idea some time ago about digital sharing. I, I think I'll, I'll also kind of you know, start addressing that by you know, throwing out a question there that you know, how, how will you feel if, if, your, if your object was stolen and then they want to provide you with digital, um, a digital object back? Um, without addressing the original object that was stolen, that that to me, I'd, I'd, you know, at the first instance, is like a slap in the face, and and I think uh, my 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 colleague um, Dan Hicks um, at Oxford will will actually look at that the same way. Um, you know, I, I've I've called him over again now. Not that um, not not that he has presented something fantastically you know, a different than what um, Alice is, is here um, addressing. Um, I, think, I think, you know, that whole idea of, you know, creating copies out of the, the original um, um, thing 
um, kind of continue to perpetuate that for which we are trying to, you know, distance ourselves from. Um, if we have to, if we have to be sincere, I think um, the first step will be to either admit guilt and let us fa fashion a way out to do, you know, addressing this solution to come to a lasting a solution to this problem, rather than you know perpetuating around it and looking for ways to, you know, kind of avoid um, addressing the beast in the house. Um, Digital sharing eventually becomes useful. Uh, take, for instance, um, there is what the European guys from Germany started a few years ago that is called a digital Benin project, where they are trying to, to create a digital platform to, you know, to, um, to kind of you know, um, trap or track where all Benin materials are, uh, are circulated around the globe. Um, for such research um, resources, that, that is understandable, but you know, providing digital copies um, as, as, as a way to like, you know, restitute doesn't really make any sense. Um, we are here addressing just Benin, for instance. Fairly recently, the, the museum where I am headed to, uh, Virginia Museum of Fine Art, they were actually caught up in this, in this um, thing about some, some institution in the Congo, the, the, which is Central Africa, um, uh, reproducing NFTs of an object that came out from the Congo to Virginia. And when this group of uh, creatives wanted to loan this thing to show in the Congo, the process of them getting it was so delayed. And then um, they had to sort for other ways to you know, uh, find relevance to using that object in, in the Congo. And they, and they went to you know, NFTs using this blockchain technology and they created um, a version of that object. And guess what? The Virginia Museum of Fine Art frowned at that. And they said they were not going to do any, they, they were not going to have any relationship with those people anymore. That is not a, that, that's not a good way to go. I, I know that the object in question it doesn't fall within that bracket of you know um, object um, that we are we are talking about restitution. But at least this this was a a, a bridge building moment for institution in the West to begin to you know have that relationship with the continent. So by by you know cutting that that you know a bridge, it means that you know we we still want to remain at at the point where we are. And, and why they are, they are dragging for the timing to release this object to go back to the Congo, another institution came to loan the object and they are prepared to loan it to the other institution that is here in America. So just to follow up with the French model of giving back the 26, approximately 26 Benin bronzes with no apology, no acknowledgement of their role in various punitive expeditions. Um, in fact, maintaining that they had preserved Benin culture in their museum. Is that acceptable too? That is not acceptable. It, um, I, I think I, I, was, I was on a Voice of America program um, in late November. Uh, that was in late November, uh, where, where you know, the same question were you know, brought. And um, I think there are two Benins here. The, the country, uh, Republic of Benin, that you just spoke about used to be Dahomey. Um, it's different from the Benin Kingdom that I speak about that is a, a state within the Nigerian nation. So returning 26 objects to Republic of Benin, which was a French colony, I, I saw a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of fanfare um, dance and, you know, all this elaborate um, event that, that, you know, welcomed those objects back. I was first, uh, you know, I picked out that first that, you know, I do not think I, there is anything to celebrate because returning it was long overdue. Uh, returning those things and then I kind of become exceptionally happy. It doesn't really make anything. The, the aggregate of what is stored in French institution, I know. Um, so, so, you know, bringing some, that's fine. But, but again, if, if you go down that lane, I think um, some of what... Um, Felwin Sa and um, Benedict Savoy were actually advocating, which to some extent, you know, tie into what I was saying, was that, you know, there should be more than just the return commitment. Uh, in the case of, you know, of Senegal, there is the Museum of Mankind that is there. In case of the Congo, there is a museum that has just been put up there. There is one also in Benin, 
in the Republic of Benin, where some of these 26 objects will eventually go to. And the, there is a museum that is in the works coming to Benin Kingdom in Nigeria. So, you know, this sort of commitment, even though they are, they are just like, you know, um, 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 spots now, I think, I think can be built upon. And, and that now sits with that my idea of, you know, human infrastructure. Because if we put these institutions there and we are not able to, to you know, adequately address the human infrastructures that will man these things, it will return back to what we have been, you know, kind of beaten about around because a lot of stuff will, will still walk away from these institutions and still come back to the West and the West will still purchase them and bring them and keep. We are addressing practical, physical institutions that are known today. There are individual holdings that we seem to be placing blind eyes on. They acquire this object too. That is another part that we are going to be looking at after dealing with the actual institutions. Yes, uh, thank you. Pro yeah, private holders are, are much harder to, yeah. to track. Um, so uh, this would also be a question for uh, Panga, which has to do with uh, not just, as you pointed out, Pusaka adds another dimension to uh, digital sharing, it, even if it's books. And as, some, as the questioners pointed out yesterday, uh, when we were dealing with the Judaica collections, digitization was seen as a positive outcome, whereas you are questioning that as a possibility, given the fact that there is this idea of uh, pusaka. So uh, the questions would be, are objects that are of religious or spiritual value to Indigenous people, either should they be repatriated far more speedily how do we decide that? Is digitization impossible for this? Thank you for the question. And, um, and it's really important discussion to have. Like I have uh, already said in the, uh, in the presentations, I think it all came back to uh, the, how we value the, the objects. In terms of the uh, Jogjakarta Manu manuscript, as of course, the, uh, the British libraries, the, the the manuscript as more as knowledge holder as, as, as so the content is more important than than the physical books but as, as pusaka of, of the palace of Yogyakarta, the 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 ownership of the physical objects or the manuscripts actually sometimes more important than the content itself and in in the most extreme case actually um, object as pusaka or manuscript as pusaka uh, the manuscript doesn't really read aloud or doesn't really read at all. Uh, sometimes the manuscripts uh, in, the, in their uh, own uh, cultural systems, these manuscripts are so believed to be the house of God as well. So that's the importance of the, of the manuscript, how they put significance to the manuscript. Because of that, uh, they believe manuscript as divinity as well. So they were worshiping uh, the manuscript as divinity as well. So that's an uh, example for the, the most um, extreme spectrum of, of, of Pusaka. But other than that, um, I think we cannot uh, compare or s put similarities between manuscript and archives. I mean, archive, you can digitize it and then uh, put it online uh, because the content is. Uh, more of, of significant value for, for, for archive, but for manuscripts, there are different uh, different point of view that we should consider as well. And um, if, my, if I might touch upon the admission of fields, uh, we mentioned before, uh, you mentioned, uh, some of you mentioned the admission of guilt as a as, as, as way to repatriate objects. Yes, I think that's, that's possible. Uh, by admitting guilt, it will uh, engender repatriation of objects. But the other way around is it doesn't really necessarily happening uh, because there's a one recent case in Indonesia uh, whereby the, uh, the, the the Netherlands returned the the kris or the, the traditional dagger of of Diponegoro, uh, which is the most revered national hero in Indonesia. Uh, that's back in 2020, March to 2020. Uh, but 
and the 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 the, the return of the keris or the taker is actually happened during the visit of the king of the Netherlands to Indonesia, and the the keris were shown in the in the presidential palace of Indonesia with both head of states present at the time uh, when the the keris displayed, but they both don't say anything during that ceremony. The king of the Netherlands doesn't say. What happened in the Chris? Uh, the Chris was actually um, uh, taken from uh, the Ponogoro during the when the Ponogoro was tricked uh, uh, to be captured by the the, the Dutch army. Uh, he was invited for peace negotiation, but then captured by the Dutch army. Uh, but the king of the Netherlands doesn't say anything about this colonial treasury, this colonial violence on the back of of the. Chris acquisition during the return of the of, of the Chris to Indonesia. So repatriation of object doesn't necessarily engender or generate admission of guilt in, in, the, in that sense, in, in, in that example. So um, yes, maybe admission of guilt, first admission of guilt can engender repatriation, but there's also other ways to have repatriation of object other than uh, admission of guilt. And uh, as uh, one, my last point for this opportunity, probably, I would also would like to say some uh, words on emotional responses. Uh, Alice talk about it with his, uh, her audience. Um, and I must say that me, myself, as uh, someone coming from the former colonized country, is, is also kind of, sometimes I feel emotional dealing with this object as well uh, because I can see the legacies, the, the, long, like, the long lasting legacies that happens uh, after the colony, the colony colonialism ended, but still there is some colonial legacies that still happening, those subtle, but you can see it happening everywhere in, in, in Indonesia as well. And sometimes dealing with this object, dealing with this legacies, uh, bring up emotional responses that really uh, sudden uh, me myself. Uh, so, actually, my question to Alice is actually whether she ever happened to have audience from from both sides, from from the former colony and former colonized countries, and what kind of interaction that happens. Maybe she could give example on on that interactions. That would be interesting to have to hear. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, no, this is something that happens all the time. I have a quite mixed audience um, in terms of the background of people, whether they're sort of from former imperial nations or former colonies, um, people like me who are in a sort of settler liminal space. Um, there's a quite wide range of, of that. And I have seen quite intense emotional responses across all of those groups. There's often a very strong kind of feeling of, of guilt that some people will bring and that is quite interesting um especially trying to find ways of, of letting people kind of have their feelings without letting white guilt take over the entire conversation is a really important balance to try and maintain um and it's something that is not always easy to do as part of that as well though there are often people who like find it really difficult to have these conversations and so there might be like an anger response um or a feeling of kind of shutting down it's incredibly common and it's happened several times on my tours where I will have people who um, might be expecting to see objects from their community of origin um, or might not be expecting to see them and then do see them. And that can be a particularly emotional response. Um, one of the kind of common recurring uh, conversations that I've had with people is more along the lines of like, the question of what it means to sort of feel able to have these conversations in a museum space, if that makes sense. Um, and the experience of being able to say like, please, you know, we can talk about this as a history of trauma. We can talk about this as a history of violence and we can see these objects and recognize that and kind of appreciate their beauty and their artistry and also talk about the violence that brought them here and the kind of juxtaposition of those things, of the sort of way that museums celebrate and treasure objects 
and the absence of that history of violence is I think the space that often provokes the most intense emotional response. I think that kind of chimes with what I think you were saying as well about how like it's being aware of the colonial history around these objects that can be quite like intense. Um, but yeah, I've, I've had conversations with people on my tours who've said like, firstly, that it's emotional to be able to have these conversations in a museum space, to feel kind of able to voice these experiences in a museum space. Um, and also the kind of shock, surprise, emotional response of seeing an object that is personally connected to you. Like it's intense. And so much about the way that museums are set up to function and these kind of, as colonial institutions and as institutions of Western power and, you know, cultural uh, authority is designed to repress emotion um, and to emphasize kind of rationality and control and composure. And so finding emotional responses can be firstly kind of difficult because of the structure of the institution, but it can also be like, you can kind of try and shut it down because you're like, oh my God, I'm in a museum, I shouldn't be crying, for example. And so making space for that and making room for that is, yeah, something that has happened a lot on my tours. And I think recognizing that these are objects with emotional histories as well as material histories is an incredibly important part of the reparative and restitutive process. Well, thank you. I wanted to ask a, few, a series of questions to all three of you about um, museum displays. So as Alice has pointed out, uh, these are colonial imperial institutions, museums as Western uh, inventions. Is it possible to um, maintain that they would be displayed more accurately, uh, more contextually, either in Benin or Jakarta? Can they, this be done in a UK museum, since that's what we're dealing with, uh, sort of copying cultural context in some very strange way. Is that spirituality aspect, is that um, accuracy aspect contradictory and the very fact of it being a museum, does that mean wherever it's located, it's gonna be that rational emotionalist point of view? Can you speak aspirationally? Can you dream about what museums can be, whether they're in the UK, Joe Jakarta, or Benin City? So I'll start with Alice. I mean, yeah, museums are colonial institutions. I think it's really important to be aspirational about what they could be. Um, I hope that it's possible to have a very different approach to museums, and I've seen mostly temporary examples, but there have been some instances of institutions like working really hard to have a kind of community-led and community-centered narrative in the stories that they tell. I think that's particularly possible outside of the cultural West. I think that recognizing like who is in charge of these museums is just as important as recognizing like the history of the museum as a colonial institution. Um, I would like museums to be better. That's why I do the work that I do. That's why I work with and around them is that I think that there has to be room for improvement and I don't think they will ever be perfect, but they could be a damn sight better than they are right now. And that is kind of the place that I'm coming at this from. I am hopeful that when we see kind of more widespread and long-term restitution to former colonies and other parts of the world, that that will also bring a change in museum practice. Um, but in the meantime, I am focused on museums in the cultural West and all I can do is hope that they keep improving and keep getting better. Thank you, Dr. Azaluma. I think from my own perspective, I, you know, be a, I, you know, I have always been this dual entity. Um, you know, I am both an insider and, a, and an outsider. I am an African first and foremost, and then I represent American institutions. And very early on when I came into the museum establishment, I have advocated for and remain consistent with the idea of you know, collaborating with the continent. Why did I say that? A lot of other materials that museums deal with in the West 
could fall within that category of what they call archaeological materials, meaning that such maybe culture are either in extinction or there is going to be very hard to trace. But Africa provides us with a more different experience. Africa as a continent is a continuum. There are human beings that still live in the continent that are still creating works, creating art. And the cultures that created the art that are stored in Western museums are still in existence. Then what beats my imagination is that, I'll, I'll create this example. In 2007, my very good friend, Barbara Plankensteiner, who was the curator at the museum in Vienna that year, she, she, she exhibited one of the most comprehensive Benin exhibition that has ever held. Uh, and it was, it was staged in Vienna, Austria. And then it traveled to um, the Museo K. Bronley Jacques Chirac in France and came to the Art Institute in Chicago. And then it went back to Europe. The Nigerian, where they, they even borrowed some object from the Palace of the Oba of Benin, and they never thought it was necessary to go and, you know, at least find a venue out in Nigeria or any other African country where, where it could be shown. Um, a lot of colleagues wanted to go see the show. They were not able to do that. But that aside, I wonder, you know, we are talking about object, object. We are, we are, we are kind of object focused here. What about the knowledge production that comes out from the object? Uh, a continent that is a living continent. We are producing knowledge behind or, you know, away from the, the, the continent. So I think, you know, if museums want to be empathic, or, you know, no matter what they want to be, they, they should not escape or avoid that task of going to the continent, collaborating with them. But if you don't want to go, we have all these means to like, you know, engage with the, with the culture communities where this object come from. They should be part of the knowledge creation of their material culture. If we, if, if we are really serious to do business, that is, what it sh that is how it should be because no matter the amount of knowledge we create, if it lacks um, an input from those cultures, we have not started a business yet. And um, I make bold to say that is one of my mandates when I work as a curator. I always look out for how the communities are also bringing in their voice into what I curate, what I write, because that is also a very big way to you know, repair the injustices of the past. And you know, we are here talking about that, 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 that there are many nuances, there are many ways we have to tie up to you know, build, that, build that back. I agree with, with you know, Mr. Pana, where, where he say it's not only Ad, uh, admission of guilt. That's true. There's not only admission of guilt. You know, knowledge creation should, should be either a shared responsibility or even should be the responsibility of, of the owner of the material. And then we can now maybe refine it, quote unquote. I don't even know what refining is here. Uh, but, but, you know, this knowledge should also come from its source to, you know, help us understand the material even much better. So, you know, it, it could come in the form of, you know, elaborate. Contextual, uh, con contextual materials, it could come in a number of ways. You know, um, I, you, um, <clears throat> the, the exhibition Congo Across the Water that, um, that I participated in in 2013, part of what made me, or, you know, what made me refer to that exhibition over and again was this idea of, you know, incorporating contemporary artistic creativity of Congo to, to show that, you know, Congo as, as a, as a, a people and culture did not go into extinction. We show contemporary artists who are getting inspiration from um, historic artistic creativity to fashion new ways of, of interpreting this culture and also their, their contemporary realities. So yeah, I, I think you know, museums in the West are actually um, been given that opportunity to, to you know, amend that bridge. I'm very happy to announce that you know um, my, myself and, uh, and colleagues in 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 in, in American uh, museums who, with African art collection have actually started a group. We are forming a history committee 
whereby we kind of work out modalities about how this collaboration will work in a very ethical way that will benefit both sides because American institution cannot stand by the wayside and watch what is happening in other places. Well, thank you. Um, I would only ask that when you talk about Africa, we don't split it the way the Europeans have and you include the entire continent, including North Africa, because those splits are European and it bothers me as someone who works in North Africa. Yeah, I, I, I think they're I, separated I, out. Yeah, I, I definitely don't. I, I will not separate it because <laughs> Egypt is Africa. It is Africa. Yeah, it is. Thank you. The last word we give to Pangar Yansha. Please, your turn. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, I think as Alice said, uh, what I've seen in the UK and the, in the museum landscape in the UK, there's definitely a lot that's been going on. Um, if you ever want to visit museum in UK, my advice is don't go to the big museum, but go to the smaller museum. <laughs> because a lot is happening in the smaller museum. For example, like in Brighton museums, uh, there's a lot of uh, activities going on. Sometimes like uh, the, uh, the, the community-led narrative happenings there. Uh, the, the, the museum invited the, the, for example, for Asian object, object from Asia, from, uh, from Iran or some place else in Asia, they will uh, invite the, the, the descendant from the Iran community, from the Asian community. Uh, but then not just, not just including the narrative for the collection from the museum itself, but also asking them to, to, uh, to create new objects as a response to that, to that collection, which is really interesting thing to me to, to, to see. And then they will display both objects uh, side by side and see that kind of uh, uh, emotional response to the, to the museum collection as well. So a lot of happening in, in the UK, in smaller museum in the UK. And um, I think I forgot to answer a question about the spiritual object as well, uh, the previous question. Uh, and it's also related to the, to the, uh, to the aspirational of, of what can museum uh, do in the future. Uh, of course, the, the, uh, the spiritual aspect of objects sometimes are not present in the museum space. Uh, I've seen this a lot in Southeast Asian museum uh, because maybe uh, the, the spiritual aspect is also something that uh, lives closer to the, to, the, to the community and at the museum as well. So it's, is 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 um is sometimes that is uh, open to or for them to to act, to actually accept them uh in more welcome to accept that kind of uh, aspect but also we need to be very careful with how we should deal with spiritual quote unquote spiritual object as well um so one example is that the 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 object taken from from the bata people in the Sumatra Island in Indonesia during the uh, uh, 19th century. Uh, and now in the, in the uh, Brussels Museum in Belgium, uh, the, the, the contemporary Bata people were asked whether they want the uh, spiritual object that were taken to be returned back to, to, to Sumatra, to Indonesia. And the answer is actually no, they don't want to them return because they believe that the spirit are gone. The spirit from the object are already gone. So for them, it's actually better to have new object created and then put spirit inside this new object rather than having the, 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 the taken object with them to them. So you need to be very careful with, with this uh, attribution of spiritual object in, in museum space as well. And uh, for my last comment, actually, because you mentioned Yogyakarta and it's also, I think for the... Uh, widely uh, non-Western museum as well. We, we've been talking about decolonizing museum in, in Europe, in Northern America, but also I need to say that we need to decolonize museum in, in Asia as well, in Asia as well, in the former uh, colonized country as well. Uh, some uh, museum here are actually uh, originated from the colonial period, so they're still having the narrative that was carried up from this uh, 
colonial construct knowledge. So we need to decolonize them as well. And because of the the, the current museum landscape in, in Indonesia, particularly, are a, a Western-led museum practice as well. So we kind of need to, to deconstruct that kind of practice as well, and then to decolonize the, the museum practice in Indonesia, not just in Europe, but also in, in Asia. We should be really thinking about what should we do to decolonize the museum space. Oh, thank you very much. In fact, there's some extraordinary colonial museums in the formerly colonized countries that need to be looked at too. So my thanks to all three speakers for an excellent session. And Jade will um, close this session and tell us about the next ones that are coming up. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much to Susan and all our speakers for a great discussion. We have so much to think about still and discuss. Um, so um, this afternoon at two o'clock, we will have another program and that one will center on indigenous knowledge systems. So it's kind of a continuation of this discussion. Um, just uh, thank you for all for coming here and we hope you will attend the other program and there's another one tomorrow. And just to a reminder that just continue to check our guide and that, that will, you will have additional information there and recordings will be on there. Um, yeah, and if there are questions that are unanswered, we might put some answers over there too. Thank you again so much and um, apologies for the lateness of the beginning and ending, but I hope you enjoyed it. Bye.